Welcome to the HMO Property Show by investors for investors. Brought to you by the HMO Property Co., Australia's leaders in impact investing. Investments made with the intention to generate a measurable, beneficial social or environmental impact alongside a positive financial return. Catch us weekly as we discuss all things cash flow positive property investing. Welcome back to the HMO Property Show. I'm your host as always, Neil Gibb. And today um, I've got, I've tapped into the wealth of knowledge back in the UK when it comes to HMO investing. And when I say I've tapped into the wealth of knowledge, I've tapped into someone that's won Property Investor of the Year, HMO Deal of the Year. He's actually won Property Developer of the Year. Uh, I've just found out that he's won a Public Speaking Award and also won HMO Trainer of the Year Award. Mr. Stuart Scott from the Core Living Revolution. Welcome to the HMO Property Show podcast. Thank you for inviting me. Absolute pleasure. Um, Obviously, there's been a few um, issues trying to get this laid on because you are seven, seven, eight hours behind us. So a little bit difficult to to line this up. Um, We got there in the end. We persevered. We got there. Absolute pleasure to have you on, mate. Really is. And um, obviously, a lot of our listeners are Australian, so uh, if you need subtitles for this episode, please let me know and we can <laughs> we can arrange that for you. Uh, so, Stuart, you've been investing in property for many years now. You're a speaker, you're a mentor, you're an author uh, of a Core Living Revolution book that's just been released, uh, which I actually read not too long ago on the beaches of Bali, which was beautiful. Um, and you've been investing in HMOs and more recently, uh, co-living HMOs, as you like to call them, uh, for quite a while now. Um, how and why did you get into investing in property? And why did HMOs become the, the vehicle of choice for you? Uh, well, my, my background was that I, I worked in um, creative agencies. Uh, pretty much most, most of my life, I worked my way up to art director, creative director, worked my way up until I got about as far as I could. And then I, I decided to start my own agency. So I started my own agency, built my own team. Uh, so that was a first one was a marketing agency. So I built that up over about 10 years and then I sold that company. Um, and then I built another company, a product innovation company. So in those, in those periods where I was running, uh, building and running those companies, I was also heading up all the innovation teams. So my background was uh, creative and innovation because uh, we were innovating products and experiences. Um, but when I was built, when I became the owner of a company, um, at that point, I then had extra dividends that were coming towards me as, 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 as the owner of a company. So I invested in property on the side, uh, but I bought stuff, added a bit of value, sold it. I was flipping. Never held. I was basically buying, well, I, I was renovating our own way up the property ladder for our own personal house, as we all do. Yeah. Um, but then I was buying and flipping property on the side. So, I mean, great foundation in adding value. I mean, it's almost the, the, the foundations of development more than anything else. Mm-hmm. Buying something at the right price, adding significant value, and having a higher end, end, end value. But then when I left, uh, when, I, when I sold my second company, I, and I exited to go full-time into property, at that point, I realized I didn't have a director's level salary anymore. And I realized I needed an income. It's great that I've been flipping properties, but I had no passive, continual cash flow income. Mm. So I looked around at what I've been doing, single lets, which was basically apartments, houses, rented just to families, pretty pretty normally. Um, and I realized it take me a, it take me a long time to get to get to my target of cash flow that I needed. So then I looked around and I realized there was what was called high yielding, high cash flowing strategies, and that led me into the world of HMOs. So this is going back, what, 2014, I think is something, something like that. And, uh, you know, I looked at the world of HMOs, which in the UK had been a very established market that had been around for a long, long time. And I know that you've kind of got a lot of background in know- knowing about that, that history. The HMO market in the UK had been around for a long, long time. But I would say that when I entered the market in 2014, it was ripe for disruption because the mar- market and the product was pretty average, bland, substandard, just devoid of any inf- innovation. So from, for me, coming from an innovation background, I just thought, this is wide open. <laughs> I can literally just innovate a brand new product and just take complete market share. 
straight away. So as someone from a from a from an innovation background, I could I could I could see there was a gap in the market. You know, there had been all these products that had been created by landlords, chopped up, divided into small little units, no attention to detail on the customer at all, and then sold for high prices. Perfect, perfect landscape for people to come in and create a customer-led and design-led product. Mm. So that's when I entered the market. So I entered the market back in 2014, and I saw an opportunity for a design-led, customer-led product into the market. And design-led, customer-led, are you referring more to the, the people that live there more than the investors? Yes, the people that live there yeah. uh, primarily. Although we uh, we as a developer are, are, are funded with investors yeah. that get as part of our journey, um, that's more the developer side of, of things. Mm. The the product that we create, there's kind of two parts to it. The product that we create is a very design-led, um, uh, pro- shared living HMO product where there's an emphasis on social spaces, breakout spaces, cinema rooms, uh, you know, garden snugs, landscaped outside gardens, you know, all those kind of facilities. Um, and that's the product. And there's a lot of things that we as a developer can do in that product to help facilitate a community. Mm. So without even going near management and operations, we, the choices we make as a developer, such as storage, layout, facilities, will mean that people are more likely to stay there longer, which drives occupancy. Mm. And then on the other side, the experience part, that's where it starts to get into the service part. That's really where you're building a community by putting all the extra layers on that if you have control over the management, you can start to organize events and you can do things that other letting agents uh, and management agents are unable to do to add that layer on, which again encourages people to stay longer and drive the occupancy. And it attracts um, a a higher caliber of tenant as well who are, willing to pay more to live in these houses as well. Yeah, I mean, we we operate in the south coast of the UK Mm -hmm. and in every single city and town that we have expanded into, we've broken rental ceilings in every single one. And we maintained consistent high occupancy. In fact, the only time we ever have an occupancy that is below 100%, it's only because there might be a really good person that can't move for a week or so and so if there is a gap in our, in our occupancy, it will only be because we actually chose to do it because the, a really good person that's been, that the community manager has met and said they would be amazing to live in the community, but there's going to be a gap of about three days between the tenancies. Is that okay? Rather than getting someone back to back, so there's no, no, no gaps at all. So as you will know from management, it's about getting the right people in and not getting the wrong people. You get the wrong people in the, in the UK – it takes a long time to get them out and, man- and manage that process. And it's a costly process and time process. So we want to make sure we've got the right people in there. Yep. So the HMO concept is is relatively new. Um, the share house concept has always been around in, in Australia, and especially in, and specifically in Western Australia. And just if, in case there's anybody from the UK listening to this, the distance between Western Australia and Sydney is essentially the same as the UK to Egypt. So quite a significant um landscape in between the countries um so on the east coast as well and a lot of the population live in sydney and and victoria as well so essentially like the londons of the of australia um yeah and on the east coast shared accommodation and co-living has has been it's growing it's growing rapidly uh in western australia it's a it's a pretty new thing um we've had student accommodation around universities but then once you get out into the suburbs um where actual people need to live there's no affordable accommodation. And mm. because it's a pretty new concept, I thought it was important to get you on to talk about the background of HMOs in the UK, like why they were brought out and the problem they were meant to fix. And you also mentioned that the, the accommodation was pretty average as well. So I'd like to hear a little bit more about that and then the, the spins that you put on it to to make your accommodation much better. Yeah. So it, as you say, it's been around in the UK, it's been around for a long time. And the legislation for HMO legislation, in fact, actually, the legislation came out when licensing came out. So HMO licensing came out. I can't remember the exact date. But when it licensing came out, HMO still existed before that, but they just weren't licensed. And then licensing came out. But prior to that, there was really this, I guess there was this, I guess it happened in America where there was the hacker houses and there was things in Silicon Valley where people would share. But there was a lot of developers hadn't really cottoned on to the fact that actually rather than just renting one house, one building to one family, one rentable unit, it was actually much better 
um, financially much better as a high cash flow strategy to move to actually renting out areas of that rooms, areas, or whatever you know, whether they're self-contained, not self-contained, whatever they are. Mm. Um, and so that model was a very big um, light bulb moment for a, a financial model for uh, renting properties out. In the same way that, should we say, holiday lets and serviced accommodation is a very is a if you had a an apartment or a house and you rent to a family, well, chances are if you move that into, for example, HMO or shared living, then you're going to get a higher return. If you move that into service accommodation or, for example, holiday lets, well, it's the same thing. You're moving from a low-yielding, low-cash flow model to a high-yielding, high-cash flow model. So that that change had happened quite early on in, in, in the UK. and But it, 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 the way it had been implemented had been very badly because no way there just wasn't a focus that the, the, the tenant was a problem. The tenant was, the tenant wasn't a housemate tenant wasn't a customer tenant was a problem. And so you've got a lot of uh, retiring older landlords where they just, you know, they saw it as a cash making machine, you know, <laughs> because they realized they could get much better revenue from it. Strategically that made sense. So that's, that's why they did it. But it was never um, the market at the time. There wasn't anything else in the market that really would be. Everything was the same. So if everything's the same, no one actually disrupted it, and it didn't didn't change for a long time. But you saw a, a proliferation of low quality, average quality product, small rooms, <clears throat> no real emphasis on social space. If you're lucky, you got a lounge, but people very rarely used the lounge because it didn't have any. They might not have had Wi-Fi. Might not have had any co-working space. Might not have had anywhere. The model really wasn't reflective of what we see now with like the you know millennium gener- millennial generation and it, what they want and what they need from spaces is not necessarily a traditional lounge. You know they have a requirement around breakfast, lunch, and dinner, which means that you know you actually you move to kind of think about your favorite coffee shop or your favorite cafe. These are spaces with whole different zones that you can see, you can relax, you can have a meeting, and really breakfast, lunch, and dinner need to happen every day if you live there. Yeah. That's the priority. So really, we kind of created less of the general lounges and then moved everything more to the experience of the breakfast, lunch, and dinner where you get more of this cafe vibe kind of space where people can use those spaces They and also they can hot desk. Because mm. remember, you, know, you can you can go to a cafe, you take your laptop, and if you've got an inspiring enough area, you can work from there. And so we do the same thing. So sometimes we have dedicated co-working spaces. But other times we have little breakout spaces for privacy, and then if you're happy to be in the main social space, which is like the main communal area, well, that should be designed in a way that when it's not breakfast, lunch, and dinner, it can also be used as this really nice inspiring space that you can work from your laptop in. Mm. So it's really those requirements um, just didn't exist yep. in the original HMO market. They just, it was simply find a house, chop it up, rent it out. That was, that was pretty much the model. Um, and really, I think a few things changed. Firstly, new players came into the market, just as I came into the market in 2014, and it was like, what a minute, this is wide open. Mm. You know, new players come into the market, and also customer expectation changes. Very quickly, disruption starts to ripple through a market. As soon as your market starts to move, you've either got to move with it or you get left behind. Mm, absolutely. So for the people that are listening to the podcast as well. I've actually been back to the UK since we started the business and we went through some HMOs in Liverpool and exactly what you mentioned, really small rooms, en suites were tiny, uh, no real communal area. It just had a kitchen and a dining area. Uh, And the room itself, it had a kitchenette in it with a hot plate um, and a double bed. And you could literally just walk in the room and then there was a walkway in between the bed and the kitchenette literally no space at all. This room must have been like 2.5 metres by 3 metres maximum. And, and probably, you could probably pick up your plate and just do a 180 <laughs> pivot and down to bed. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Uh, so with the co-living revolution uh, and the, the accommodation you provide, bigger space, and, and I've seen the pictures of some of the things that you that you bring to market. It's uh, incredible and it's inspirational as well. Um, and we are going to try and implement something very similar. Um, but what we have done is we've kept the kitchen, dining, and living area in every single house. So they've got this big communal space where they can come out yeah. and socialize if they need to. Um, however, they can also go back in the bedrooms and stay in the bedrooms if they need to as well. 
uh, and uh, you know we got. And it's all about that. balance as yeah. well, because I think the other thing that we've seen as well is, I think when co living as a concept started to get kind of get a lot of popularity, there's a big focus on community, mm. and obviously that, that means you know it's about social spaces and as you said, the, what, you're, what you're doing now, which is the the large communal areas are really important, and people love to you know uh, network and be able to kind of like meet friends and chat to people over their breakfast, lunch, and dinner times. Yeah. Um, but equally, sometimes people don't feel social. Mm. So if you can balance that together, that's where breakout spaces become really important. So suddenly then you've got your bedroom, which is all about comfort and storage, and then you've got your social spaces. Now, breakout spaces is where you give them more options beyond that main social space. So if it's busy in there, I can go to the garden. There's seating. There's a nook. There's a snug. There's a garden room. There's a small little oversized hallway with a, with a little bit of seating in. Those breakout spaces complement the main social space and they they address that one of the main things that that people get moving into co-living are asking for that balance between privacy and social mm. so ticking the boxes on both of those means that you're going to drive occupancy because that's the other thing just to just to mention that it's really important for your listeners as well you can create the best product in the market and you can get a whole lot of people in the door but what we don't want is churn churn is where we lose customers because, you know, you're going to have to pay to bring them back in again, all the marketing, everything else. Mm. So we can create the best product on the market, but then we want to create the kind of product that's really usable so that they stay longer. So those two parts become really important, product and usability. And that defines the user experience. Exactly. And that, and that, that equates what the financial incentive to us as developers is that equates into longer term occupancy and higher rents. Mm. Um, how many, do we know roughly on average, how many HMOs are actually in the UK licensed right now? Roughly. Oh, um, a lot. It's, it's a big, <laughs> it's a very big market. It's yeah. a very big market. In the UK. And also, and also you've got large HMOs and small HMOs. Smaller HMOs were more recently brought in through selective licensing. So, so there's smaller ones that are in the, you know, you get a lot that are from four, four to six bedrooms. That was a big slice of right across the whole uk mm -hmm. and then of course you've got everything from 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 uh upwards from six upwards and sui generis which means seven or more so everything above was always you know uh, had licenses um since they introduced them and then they, they started bringing ones in to capture the smaller ones as well mm. the reason i ask that question is a lot of people that i speak to think that <clears> this is going to become a saturated marketplace very fastly in western australia uh, bearing in mind, we've got urban sprawl, uh, f uh, which is 130 mm. kilometres from the most northern city to the most southern city, uh, with a population of 2.5 million people. Now, we've got 500 beds under management, and we've got a goal in the business to bring 10,000 rooms to the market by 2031. Yeah. Have we got you, a, you, have we got there's a no risk. There's no risk of saturation. <laughs> <laughs> there's no risk of saturation. Brilliant. That's what, that's what I need. Not on your number. No way. No way. <laughs> Because you've got you're in with your targets, you've got the, the growth targets of the cities as well. Yeah. The cities are going to be growing. And also, and I'm assuming this is the same for you you guys over there, which is you basically got a few choices when you move out of home. You move to a location, you move to a city, you're either living at home or you move out. And if you move out, what's the first thing you're going to do? Well, certainly in the UK, you're going to get what, a studio or a one bed flat? Well, if you can't afford that, and if you do that, you've got all the bills. Mm. Now, you might know some people to share with, and that is a possibility. But if you don't, well, actually, now you're going to go into an environment where you're going to share, but that's going to be like a it's like a it's like a ramp up the you know you haven't quite got to the point yet that you want the isolation of maybe a one bed flat completely on your own, but you kind of got these entry levels. So certainly, what we've seen in the UK, and I'd be very surprised if we don't see a similar thing uh, in Australia, is that that shared living has a part to play on that ladder, and it's always a ladder of affordability because at the end of the day, you're providing social aspect, which is really, really important. Yep. All the global data points to the fact that people want to build their social network around them and a support network around them and affordability. So it's, it's, it's more affordable than living in a studio in a one-bed flat, and, it's, um, uh, and, and you're accessing the, the community as well. The other question I normally get asked, Stuart, is will this work in a market when the market's going down? Because right now in Western Australia, we're in a pretty hot market. Uh, we're seeing yeah. 15 to 20% growth in more suburbs in the last 12 months. Um, and people think that the reason that there's so much demand is because the market's going up. Have we had a situation in the UK where the market's gone down and we've still seen the same amount of mm -hmm. demand for shared accommodation? 
uh, do you mean when you say the market go up and down? Do you mean that the demand, the demand, you mean that the value of property? Yes, yep. the value of property. Uh, well, I mean, let's take for example the UK at the moment. So the UK has been going through quite a boom uh, of, uh, 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 of values jumping the last two, three years. I mean, it was always going up anyway, but it really exploded going up. Mm-hmm. And then obviously we've had a little bit of a wobble in our market where it's leveled off a little bit recently. But but we have a supply and demand issue. You're going to find this as well in your market. We have a supply and demand issue, which means that, that um, there's just not enough um, – rental stock out there and there's certainly not enough shared living out there that's that's um that's that's available so you've got multiple people fighting over every single space that there is so that supply and demand issue is never going to change now obviously the, de- the the develop us as a developer is can we buy the buildings at the right price can we refinance them at the right price that's a developer problem yeah but for a rental problem that's certainly we haven't seen any effect in, in the rental market if anything we all saw a little bit of a strange thing going on during covid because COVID changed everything for a little bit. But what we've seen even in the market now is the demand, a very, very strong demand uh, for for rental stock available. It's certainly a certainly a, um, a package, a kind of coding HMO package deal where they're getting everything wrapped in. So that's always been very popular. The challenge for us as developers is accessing funds, making sure that the numbers stack with regards to um, purchasing and exiting onto a a correct mortgage product. Yep. That's that's a yep. separate challenge to the um, the demand side of things. Demand not really affected in any way. It's really a, a developer yeah. challenge. Yeah, yeah. Um, let's talk about the book, the Core Living Revolution. Um, and also, was the book brought in off the back of the the mastermind as well? Because I know you've got the Core Living Mastermind, um, which is you teaching other investors how to basically implement this and bring a, a much better product to the market. Was the book off the back of that or was the book in time? Um, well, the book, the book was supposed to come first, yeah. but I think as we spoke just before we started this podcast, it book took me several years to write. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I think when you start writing a book, you think you know what you're writing and then you start writing it and then you realize you don't know what you're writing and then you reformat it a few times and then you restructure it, put it apart. So it's, it's a process. So I, I wanted to, I wanted to write a book that was about how how we created co-living HMOs in the UK. So I could talk about the, un- the underpinning principles, product innovation, customer, brand, all the things that underpin this kind of new movement of a very design-led, customer-led product, which has become co-living. So I wanted to talk about how that how that's um, created. And also from the strategy side, all the way through to the product and the implementation side, um, and there what I, what I noticed in the, the certainly the, the I mean I, I like yourself I, I buy a lot of books and um, one thing I noticed was that that you know firstly all the books <laughs> certainly all the ones I read you know uh, you know page you know it's forty thousand words and a few few illustrations not really inspiring in the same way you know you know a lot of us are very visual oh, yeah. you know yeah. so. I wanted to create a design-led, full-color book, front to back, where everything from the production of the book and design of the book and the illustrations and the, the photography, all the way through color photography, all the way through the book, felt like the experience of when you see co-living for the first time. That's why it was designed. That's why it took so long. So, yes, it was actually the other way around. It was supposed to be the book first, and then I started doing uh, the training. But what I actually found from doing training and helping people was I realized that a lot of people struggled with strategy. How do I find the assets? How do I recycle funds? How do I find the best areas to invest in? There was a lot of strategy before. You could even get excited about, um, you know, launching your product. You know, a lot of people can get excited about, yeah, I can create this amazing product. And, you know, you can, vi- you can envision it and see it. So, that, you know, that would be fantastic in the area that they want to do it. But, of course, they need to secure the assets and they need to be able to get the funding and they need to be able to get the business model so that they, as a developer, can execute delivering it. And so I realized what, through doing the training that I wrote about another 7,000 words that became the strategy section at the front of the book. Yeah. So I th- I'd almost finished the book and then I wrote the strategy section at the front because so many people wanted more on numbers and finances and case studies and stuff like that. So in, and so I'm glad I did it that way around. Um, but that's 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 why it uh, uh, that's that's why we created it. I created it so that I could kind of put a flag in the sand and say, look, this is this this talks about how we were able to innovate and create co-living in the UK 
And I wanted to make sure that it shared with people the principles about product innovation, customer and brand in a way that regardless of where you are in the world and different country, you can take those principles to innovate and create a better product in your market. Yep. Love it. Love it. What it, what did catch me when I first started reading the book, the, the first page actually says what worked many years ago in property investment will no longer work. What, do yeah. you, what did you mean by yeah. that? Well, okay, I'll give, I'll give you an example. So uh, one of the one of the guys that I worked with on one of my masterminds, very experienced developer, has quite a sizable student HMO portfolio. And he came to me because he had bought that portfolio about 15 years ago, something like that. And then he came to me and said, look, I'm getting major occupancy issues. So his occupancy was starting to nosedive down. And so we kind of investigated it, looked into it. It turns out what you, basically new players have entered the market. They're like, you, you know, you will see this in your market as well. New players will enter the market. Anyone where you see success, other people will want to imitate their success. New players came into his market. They started up in their product and people were choosing. The customer had more choice. They were choosing that. So suddenly his occupancy is diving down. In his own words, he said, look, what worked for me years ago no longer works. It was his words. And so we looked at it, and what we had to do is we had to look at review his product that he had. Start. We couldn't go back to brick and do major works, but what we could do is get some quick wins. We looked at social spaces. We looked at ratio of bathrooms to rooms. We looked at some of the elements for, for hot desking and co-working space. So we kind of adapted his product so that we could get his occupancy back up to 100%. And also, he was able to achieve rents that he never thought he could have ever achieved. Just through some small tweaks. Quick small wins. tweaks. What had worked years for him, he hadn't changed his product. So, in fact, what we can take from that is there was someone who created a product and they stood still. The product didn't move. Markets moved, but their product didn't move. Mm. Now, I mean, we can look at that time and time again. Uh, Sony Walkman. Yep. Kodak cameras. Yep. So many times where if you stop market moves and you don't move forward and you don't continue innovating, you don't continue moving forward or pushing boundaries, you stay still, worst possible thing you can do. Game over. Uh, I think that story perfectly illustrates what happened. You know, he was a, a very good landlord. You know, he, what, he created a good product at the time, but 15 years later, that's not serving the customer. Mm. So and they have more choice. Sorry, that's the other key thing we've got to remember. The customer has choice. Mm. They vote with their feet. The important thing there, and I know you, you focus on the customer, we do a lot of surveys with our tenants. <clears throat> we get feedback of how they're feeling, how they're living, the experience with our property management team. So we send them a survey yeah. six weeks in and we get feedback from them. How is your experience? How do you how are you settling into the house? What can we do better as a, as a property management business? That feedback is absolutely gold for us. Um, it is. It's, it's valuable. I think um, some people shy away from doing research. Mm. And certainly when um, when I was in the agencies running the innovation work, Everything comes from customer research. And in fact, you want for there to be problems. That's the whole point. You want that if some if someone's if someone votes you low for would you recommend your service and they get a low vote, you want to know what that vote that that what, what caused that. Okay. And you might be able to find that there was a, a, a subtle thing that was in your processes or in your service that could be tweaked. It could be a really quick win. Um, but as long as you know what it is, you can you can ensure that you're constantly pushing your product and your service forward. So in your in, in management, for example, you want to be the best service in the market. Mm. And then you would always be ahead of the competition. Doesn't matter what new management agent agents come into the into the market, you will always be ahead of the shoulders above them. As long as you're listening to customers, you're constantly tweaking and moving forward. Yeah. I would say the, the property management team, all feedback is good feedback, whether it's positive or negative, because yeah. we can use yeah. that to improve. All feedback's good. The, yeah. the, the bad stuff is gold dust. Um, so being ahead of the trend, obviously the, the guy we just spoke about there, he didn't move with the trend. And right now where you're seeing the sweet spot with hit co-living HMOs uh, and having the most success there, where do you see the landscape changing over the next 10 years? Um, well, there's a few key things that will, that kind of top of the agenda, energy efficiency, massively top of the agenda everything that we consider on energy efficiency now will probably not be sufficient years from now mm -hmm. we're going to have to completely change our mindset on how we insulate or how we both insulate buildings how we integrate technology into buildings and how we generate energy for buildings 
I mean, and that's no small mean that's no small feat because of course in the UK you've got a lot of aging old stock where they have um, we have e- you'll remember from being in the UK EPCs EPCs is the energy rating for the building and there's some very very low EPCs which means the energy inefficient buildings. So people are going to have to insulate, but that's at the very basic level. We're going to have to insulate. We we need moving forward, and we've we've all seen this around the world because of energy prices and things that we've seen fluctuate. Now we're going to need to look at uh, both the energy efficiency, the technology, and the energy generation of buildings in a completely different way. And this is really this global situation has really probably pushed it up the agenda in in a positive way. So yeah, uh, I think that the certainly in the near term, for a lot of the uh, curving HMO stock, it's really working through more efficient ways. Because remember, with the whole specification is starting to change. I mean, you you also build out yeah. projects as well, and you will know that when we build them out, we create a schedule of work and a specification. And part of that is the is is the is the makeup of the building and how it's insulated and how the energy system, what kind of energy system it has, gas, electric, all these various different things. So we are specifying these buildings. Those specifications will will radically change as we start to move into the future. Mm. Um, So I I certainly want to be on the the front end of experimenting with um, being aware of all the ways we're going to start to adapt and change that and get that almost blueprint of what that new future blueprint will be as early as possible. Do you think the the end user, the tenants, uh, are concerned about the the energy usage and uh, the... The energy rating of the um, property that they live in, it depends. Are they more conscious? Well, it depends on, I mean, most shared living, certainly most shared living in the UK is an all bills included model. Same here, yeah. So they, there's a lot of, there's a lot of customers that vote with uh, ethical requirements in there. So knowing that all the energy comes from renewables is really important. So that's more of a customer thing. Yeah. Um, and obviously with, 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 educating them to be more mindful of their energy use because otherwise if they're not if they're not super um aware of what they're doing with energy it will reflect into rents so you know there is an incentive that we don't have to put rents up as much if we can be more energy efficient on our buildings so there's an incentive uh, for them there um but they don't i would say that the main um focus for for the housemates is, is really the effect that it might have on rents and rent levels. They're already choosing to be in there because they know that they're not having to deal with energy companies as being in a one bed flat, a two bed flat or a house. So they, they don't have to deal with all of that. Um, they're aware of it. They're aware of the fact that global prices are going up and they're aware of everything else. So uh, at the moment it would be reflected in rents, but if we can make our houses more energy efficient, then actually that's good for everyone. Mm, absolutely. I mean, there, there could be something in the future where we actually start to generate the energy. I'm, I'm, what I'm really interested is in a lot. There's a lot more people putting solar PV. I mean, you've got. I mean, obviously Australia, you can have. You've got a lot of sun, <laughs> so you know, a shortage of areas for solar PV. But yeah. you know, in the UK, we're just starting to bring more of that solar PV in, um, and we don't know what that 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 next step is yet, because it's not just that gas boilers are being stripped out. Because we can't a whole infrastructures through gas. Mm. So if we're going to go to hydrogen, or we're going to go to something else, with we're just on that transition. Mm. So that transition is really, really important moving forward. Yeah, we uh, we are very fortunate in Australia. We do have a lot of sunshine, uh, so uh, PV as you call it, or solar uh, solar panels yeah. as they're commonly known. Um, we install them as standard in our new builds. And we also have batteries going in them as well. So we've just signed a deal with a, a solar and battery provider so that um, we've, we're going to stop running gas lines into these properties and they're going to run 80% wow. off grid. Yeah. And that's that, that transition that you're, 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 you're further ahead because of your, because of the, um, uh, the climate and because of the, the sun that you get, you're further ahead on that. In the UK, we're certainly that transition is only just starting to get a real emphasis and had, had we not had the uh, global energy price um uh, spike that we're all in the middle of at the moment um hard to know whether that would have been as fast tracked because you know it's a slow moving market yeah. but this is a good thing because you know as you're talking about you know solar is one thing but without any form of capturing that and storing it it becomes less efficient mm. so really the battery the battery systems that go on with solar became a really good innovation that came in years ago. Their prices have come down now. Of course, it would be almost ridiculous not to have some form of storage. Mm. 
with your batteries. You don't want to just lose the energy if you haven't got anywhere to put it. So yeah, that, and, and like you say, removing the gas out completely, generating energy into your buildings, it changes the makeup of how you insulate and create the specification. Yeah, good. Good to hear that we're on the right path. <laughs> You're on, definitely on the right path. But I see that as, you know, certainly with co-living HMOs in the near term, it's going to be all about, you know, the changing specification of how we build these buildings to be more efficient. And also the, um, the uh, for sustainability, for the impact and the sustainability of what, what we're generating and creating at a build level as well. So that's in the near term, I see that as being a... But, but one thing just to mention about shared, shared living and HMOs is that this requirement as we move into the future is, is for shared living. You know, there's always, and we've seen this in the UK since, since uh, uh, you know, many decades ago, there's always a requirement on the stepping stone uh, before, you're, before you're willing to move to more privacy. So when you want that more social living, before you then move to what, one bed flats and two bed flats and you settle down and you have a partner, that bit there has always had a part to play and will continue to, especially in the future when cities get bigger. You know, because let's be honest, the, the planet in a hundred years time from now is going to look very different than now. Mm. We we think areas are built up. That's nothing compared to the future. You know, New York. That's built up. <laughs> that's built up. <laughs> but most of the cities that we have in the UK, and certainly, you know, when I've been to, been to Australia, they're nowhere near as built up as they will be in the future in a hundred years from now. Yeah, true, true. Especially with migration. We've got a lot of people moving to this country every single year. Uh, and right mm. right now, um, I was speaking to a guy yesterday, he said we've got 500,000 vacant jobs in Australia and we've got no one to fill them. So we need to turn the yeah. tap on for migration again, which means we need to bring more people in the country, which means we need to build more houses, yeah. which means... Yeah, no, I, I think there's, uh, there's always a part to play for shared living. I suppose it's, uh, it's, it's about understanding the niche and the step on the ladder that it provides. Mm. Um, and also every building has multiple exits. We as developers, because we're talking about the co-living HMO strategy, which is the main one. But, you know, I, I also own several hotels. So my hotels business is almost like I have long stay and I have short stay. <laughs> nice. And yes, there's a load of legislation and planning and various other things that you will know as a developer is the difference between when you're building things. But really, I'm tapping into two markets. Mm. One is a, a kind of um, tourism slash guest market. And the other one is a long stay home market. It's really being diversified as, as landlords. If I spot a building, it will either be perfect for short stay or long stay. Nice. Nice, mate. Um, how can people connect with you, Stuart, if, um, if anyone reaches out, if anyone wants to buy the book, if anyone wants to follow you on social media, uh, if anyone wants to get access to the mastermind, for instance, um, how can we find yeah. you? Uh, well, if you just Google the co-living revolution, it should literally come up at the top of Google. Yeah. Uh, so if you go onto Amazon, the co-living revolution it will come up straight at the top on there you can get you can get the um uh, the audio book will come out but at the moment it's it's an ebook and it's uh, also the sorry the kindle and it's the paperback um and then yeah if you just go onto google and just type in the co-living revolution it will go straight to the co-living revolution.co.uk and then you can you can contact me from there if, all the details are on there excellent and is there anything that i haven't asked you in this podcast which you think i should have asked you um A lot of people ask me about it. Usually it's the design. People always, because we've got very experimental design in, in, in a lot of the stuff that we do. Yeah. Very, you know, trendy kind of urban industrial coffee shop kind of stuff. I think that one of the things I would just kind of mention, I guess, on design is, and I, and I did a talk, I did a talk the other day, uh, uh, sorry, about a couple of weeks ago, an event, and um, I talked about constant innovation. The most important thing that I could share on the design side with for the product, for any developers or, or, or landlords listening would be that you've got to constantly experiment. So the, under, the underpinning of innovation is running experiments. Now, you know from running your surveys, what, when you run your surveys, you get information in, yeah? Mm -hmm. So those bits of information come in, or they're ideas that you came up with on the stuff that you guys are working on. And then what happens is you run an experiment. And so what you want to be doing in, in every project that you run put some experiments in there in the way, same way you experimented with uh, the battery power packs. Yep. Then on the next one, you experimented with something else. The underpinning, some people think that they don't innovate. If you're running experiments, you're innovating. So just constantly run experiments in every project you do. 
If you're doing that, you are effectively that is that is how our innovation is about listening to the customer, running experiments, learn. Listen to the customer, running experiments, learn. And you just loop. Simple as that. Beautiful. Thank you, Matt. Um, what's your favorite quote? I like to ask the guests what their favorite quote is, so we can end on that. Well, I've got a really short one. I looked at some of the quotes you sent over to me. A really, a really short one for you. Um, quality over quantity. Beautiful, mate. Stuart Scott, thank you very much for your time, mate. It's very much appreciated. Thank you. Thanks for listening. Make sure you tune in the same time next week so you stay up to date with all the cash flow positive property updates.